thank you so much to Maria Grazia and my friends at Meet and Viviana and friends from uh, Milan Longevity Summit. And thanks so much to all of you for coming tonight, both in person uh, and virtually, to discuss what I believe is the essential question of this moment of human habitation on Earth. Uh, because the basic story of this moment on Earth is that after nearly four billion years of evolution, our one species, among the billions of species that have ever lived, suddenly has the increasing ability to engineer intelligence and re-engineer life. This is an astounding moment in the history of our planet. And the sole question that will determine whether this is a great story of human beings unlocking potential, or this is a story of human beings giving ourselves power that we weren't able to wield, is all of us and the decisions that we make guaranteeing that our most sacred, cherished, and in many cases, traditional values can be deployed to guide the application of our most powerful technologies. That's what this is about. It's not a conversation about technology, although the conversation about technology is mind-boggling. And we have to understand the technology and what the technology is capable of because that will force a level of decisions upon us. But this is not about technology, it's about values. As was just mentioned, uh, my new book, Super Convergence, is coming out in June in English. I think it's quite likely there'll be an Italian version uh, coming. I think Maria Grazia is arranging for it. Um, uh, and what this book is about is essentially the three, uh, as I see, most important drivers, technological drivers of what's happening. It's the intersection of the AI, genetics, and biotechnology revolutions. And the idea of superconvergence is that this isn't about any one technology. Every one of these amazing technologies is woven in to every other technology. Just to, to give a simple example, we have a computer technology revolution which makes a machine learning revolution possible. And with the tools of machine learning, we're able to interrogate biological systems. And biology has solved a lot of problems over the last four billion years. And among them are storing information and just very efficient ways to organize. And with those biological designs, we're now able to develop faster computer chips, neural network computing systems, all of these other capabilities that speed up everything else. I'm particularly thrilled to be here in Milan because Milan, like all cities, but maybe more than most other cities, is an imagined city. All of these amazing artists and visionaries, Leonardo da Vinci and others who were here, were not saying what could be in an abstract way. What they were saying is, what are the new capabilities of this time? What were the new capabilities of this moment and then what can we do with those capabilities? Leonardo was thinking about solving problems, big problems, abstract problems, complex problems, but problems. And if Leonardo were, arrive, were alive today, what he would be asking are the exact same questions that MEET is organized to ask, that Milan Longevity Summit are organized to ask, is that with these tools, what can we do? And he and the others would say, with these tools, what should we do? How can we do these things best? And when I talk about these ideas, they can feel very abstract to people. They're, in some ways, these ideas are so big and so broad that it's hard for people to say, hey, this is about me and me personally and my life. And so. What I would like to do with this slide is to introduce you to two very special people. Um, this is my mother. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in New York City. And then in the middle is my father, uh, born in Austria, came to the United States when he was 13 in 1948 as a refugee after the war. They met, uh, came to my, uh, uh, my hometown of Kansas City, uh, where I was born. Uh, this is me uh, with my parents. 
a couple of uh, a couple of years ago. Here's where they are uh, where they are now. Um, this maybe some of you are unfamiliar with American hand gestures. So the gesture that my father is making is in America our way of saying I love you. Um, so this is my father uh, saying I love you. Um, uh, but this, was ta this picture was taken actually a year and a half. Uh, we met Liliana this morning at the event uh, with the mayor uh, and Liliana, what's Liliana's last name? Segre. Liliana Segre, inc incredible woman. I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with her, 94 years old, survived Auschwitz, and yet lived this very positive, contributing life with all of this energy. And that's the same as my, as my father, wasn't in, in a concentration camp, but technically a Holocaust survivor. And with that background, he said, well, I'm going to be such a positive, optimistic person that it's going to take a lot to knock me off of being an optimist. optimist. As a matter of fact, his friends have criticized him. They said, we could dump a bucket of manure on your head and you'd still be smiling. And, and I, that's just how my dad has lived. And so this is my father a year and a half ago, soon after receiving his cancer diagnosis for stage four metastatic neuroendocrine cancer, a year and a half ago. And neuroendocrine cancer, if you're not familiar with it, is the cancer that Steve Jobs died from. So it's a very, very serious cancer, stage four uh, metastatic. And so, as I said, I'm from Kansas City uh, soon after he get, uh, had this diagnosis, and we have a, a friend from Kansas City here as well, I gave him a hat from um, the, so American football is different than European football. Just kidding. Um, American football, we have a team in Kansas City called the Kansas City Chiefs. And so my dad, uh, like many people who came to the United States in the 1940s and 1950s, professional sports and rooting for professional sports was their way to become American as quickly as possible. So a lot of people from that generation are just like my father, fanatical sports fans. I gave him this hat, and those of you who are sports fans know this, uh, that when you root for a sport and root for a team, the entire success of the team is based on your actions. And so I told my father, I'm giving you this hat, you have to, one, keep the hat on, and two, you need to stay strong and healthy because the Kansas City Chiefs are depending on you for their support. So he put on the hat, he literally, he took it off when he slept, uh, but that was really uh, about it. So then he, we started him on his, uh, his treatment. Now they've, two years ago, they moved to Denver and we have this wonderful young oncologist. And the first step, uh, the first treatment was a standard chemotherapy treatment. And my father tolerated that treatment really well. Um, but the problem was that it didn't really help. So the cancer based on the scans was advancing. At that time, we thought he had about six to nine months more of healthy living. At that exact same time, however, I was also writing the healthcare chapter of my book, Super Convergence, uh, and was deeply immersed in the intersection of the AI, genetics, and biotechnology revolutions with the future of cancer care. And so I was adamant from day one, saying we're not gonna do this like Steve Jobs. We're going to sequence everything. And so even though it wasn't standard of care for his particular cancer, to sequence everything from day one, we did it. And after the first chemo didn't work, we kept looking to see, well, are there places, are there in the cancer genome that can be targeted? And it turned out that we found one. And then we had a question of, we're gonna take one of two paths for how to treat him. The first one that the oncologist was recommending was a very aggressive chemotherapy. And so with this chemotherapy, there was a 100% chance that it was going to knock my dad on his rear. There was a 100% chance you have all the issues with hair, with tiredness, just with feeling terrible. And there was a 30% chance that it would possibly uh, help. And that didn't seem like great odds. It's better than nothing. And so I, I and we really dug into the literature 
there were a total of 30 people with his specific cancer who had been treated with this targeted agent genetic therapy, which was a treatment for other types of cancer, but it hadn't really been used on this type of cancer. And so I really pushed for that because I figured, well, maybe it doesn't work at all, but maybe it works a lot. And I'd rather take a risk on something that could work a lot than taking something on a risk that probably wasn't going to work. And so we did it. I don't expect anybody other than you to know this, but last year, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. And so at that time, I was in Dubai. Um, so that was um, uh, about uh, eight months after his diagnosis. And he wore the hat, and the Chiefs won, and we were on a WhatsApp video call, and he was just in total ecstasy at that, at that point. So that was, uh, that was eight months. This is last month, a year and a half after the diagnosis, my brother and I took our father uh, to the Super Bowl in Las Vegas. We were right there um, when, in overtime, the Kansas City Chiefs won. And so this, we talk about longevity and longevity week and the science of longevity. What we're talking about is time. What we're talking about is getting more time so that we humans can realize our potential, that we can do more human things, love each other, imagine things. We had a famous, have a famous poet in the audience, write poetry, do all of the things that make us human. So this, again, it's not about the technology, it's about us. But also, again, the technology is pretty darn mind-boggling. So raise your hand uh, if you have used ChatGPT in any way. Raise your... Perfect. So most people have. And we use ChatGPT for a lot of us. We go on and we use it. And it's kind of like a Google search. It's like a cool Google search. It's a smarter Google search. But it feels kind of like a Google search. And if we didn't take a step back and think about what's happening, we would say, wow, the story of generative AI is we're going to get Google search that two that's two times better. But if I ask you, how did writing or electricity or farming, agriculture, influence your life today, you couldn't answer that question because most every aspect of your life is connected to agriculture that's allowed us to live in the cities, to have the civilizational growth uh, that we have, to industrialization and electrification. So uh, electricity is in my suit, it's in this carpet, obviously it's in the, the projector, uh, it's in the fact that we're living here, that we got here, Really everything, our educational systems, electricity is everywhere. You can't filter out electricity because it's a general purpose technology like everything else. And that is what we're experiencing now as a intersecting number of general purpose technologies that are touching everything. And when they do, same thing with my dad at the Super Bowl, they unleash human imagination and human potential. So let's take another even bigger step back. A hundred years ago, there were three billion people living on planet Earth with a roughly 15 uh, percent, I'm sorry, two billion people uh, on planet Earth with a roughly 15 percent literacy rate. So that means about 300 million people able to, able to participate in the world of knowledge shared beyond their immediate communities. You could do a lot with that, but 300 million people. Today, we have 8 billion people with an 85% literacy rate. So that's just shy of 7 billion people who are able to participate in the world of shared knowledge. So just in terms of the application of human brain power, it's a lot more bla uh, brains connected to each other. And because we're connected to each other through these, these networks, um, we don't need to solve problems 
that have already been solved anywhere in the world. In the world, that's what this image is. Um, when you were all in school, when we were all in school, we learned about the different ages: the Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. And once civilizations had access to these metals or recipes for these metals, there were lots of really cool things that you could do from hunting to going to war or whatever else that you wanted to do, these metals were super empowers. And that's why we even define many of, our, of these ages in human history by the access of the, of the capabilities to do things like this. But we also learn that different civilizations had thousands of years of differential from when they, they developed the recipes for these metals from others. So if you're in a civilization that didn't have access to the recipe for bronze or iron or whatever for 2,000 years, you weren't able to contribute to the knowledge pool of people thinking creatively about how to do cool things with bronze or whatever that is. That's not the case that we're, we have today. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you make an innovation today, it goes up online, and tomorrow, everybody's starting point, everybody's starting point for that day is all of knowledge that exists within human history up to that point. So that alone is just an unbelievable accelerant. And so now let's talk about, with these intersecting capabilities, just one company. I'm just gonna talk about one company over the last eight years. And that company is Google DeepMind that I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with. And if you haven't had Demis Hassabis to come give a speech here, I hope, I hope that you will. Um, so in 2016, as you know, uh, DeepMind had a program called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo competed against the world champion in the ancient Chinese game of Go in a five match series uh, that was held in Seoul. For those of you who don't know, Go is a much more complicated game than chess. There are orders of magnitude more options for each move in Go than in chess. And that's why, even though years before, IBM's Deep Blue had defeated Garry Kasparov, people thought 10 years ago that it would be many decades before an AI system could win at Go because of that complexity. So in 2016, AlphaGo defeated Lee Sedol Four, uh, four games to one. So out of five games, AlphaGo uh, um, had one. But in a way, I'm mean, sorry, um, Lisi Dole had one. But in a way, it was kind of cheating because the way that they trained AlphaGo is they got all of the digitized games of human Go masters, and that was the training set. So AlphaGo said, well, here's all of these AlphaGo, all these Go masters, and you have to learn what makes a winning game. And so if you imagined it, it was, here was poor little Lee Sedol, just a human grandmaster in one chair. And in the other chair were 10,000 grandmasters who over the years had played games of Go that were digitized. So it was kind of a lot of humans in a way beating one human, including the programmers. The next year in 2017, AlphaGo faced its next opponent, also developed by the same company, which was AlphaZero. AlphaZero didn't have access to any of the digitized games of human Go masters, but what they did is they fed AlphaZero the rules of Go, and they gave it a reward system, a tokenized reward system, where they said, we want you to play Go against yourself, and every time you make a move that contributes to victory, give yourself positive reinforcement, and every time you have a move that doesn't contribute to victory, give yourself negative reinforcement. And so Alpha Zero started playing Go against itself. It was terrible in the beginning, but every time it got a little better and a little better and a little better. And eventually it got to the point where it was able to defeat Alpha Go, hi Risa, which the year before had defeated the world's greatest human grandmaster. How long do you think that process took of Alpha Zero going from the worst Go player in the world to the greatest Go player in world history? Three days. Three days. 
Three days is what that took. And in 2018, the next year, DeepMind said, well, we're not in the business of gaming. We're in the business of solving the problem of intelligence. And like I mentioned with Leonardo da Vinci, solving the world's most toughest, most difficult problems. And so they said, what we'd like to solve now is the problem of predicting the shapes of protein, the so-called protein folding problem. Just a quick background. I don't want to make this too technical. Um, but uh, proteins, our bodies are made of proteins. Life is made of proteins. If you sequence a protein, you get a chain of amino acids. Um, but the, that chain, knowing that sequence of letters, uh, won't tell you enough about how that protein will function because it's not just the order of the letters, it's the shape of the protein in the folding. And so one of the biggest problems, challenges in biology is protein folding, predicting the shape of protein from the sequences alone. And if you have, you're able to do these predictions, it, it speeds everything up that you're doing in research and applications using proteins. And whether that's developing new medicines or new treatments for all sorts of things, new industrial applications and everything else. And so there has been, for years, a protein folding competition. And the way that they do it is we have traditional ways before uh, alpha, uh, alpha fold ways of characterizing a protein. And you do it with x-ray crystallography. You turn the protein essentially into a crystal and then you x-ray the crystal and little by little, you can characterize a protein and then compare that shape uh, to the letters. That takes about three years. And so in this competition in 2018 that, uh, that Alpha Fold entered, DeepMind entered for Alpha Fold, uh, they came in a disappointing 20th place. And so they went back, they rejiggered the algorithm, they came back in the 2020 competition because it's biannual. And in 2020, Al uh, Alpha Fold won this competition so handily that Nature Magazine called the protein folding problem essentially solved. So that's 2020. 2021, uh, DeepMind, with the European Bioinformatics Institute, released the sequence, the uh, protein fold predictions of 350,000 proteins, including all of the proteins in the human body. So if you just do the math, 350,000 times three years, it's like one million years of effort, of researchers, of academics, there's one million years of effort that would have had to go in to characterizing these proteins the old-fashioned way can instead go into doing things with characterized proteins. It's the same point that I made earlier with the Copper Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. You're starting with the thing. So that's one million years went back into the pool of human innovation. That's 2021. 2022, DeepMind uh, released the predictions of 215 million proteins. 215 million proteins, all of the proteins known to science. So 215 times three, 645 million years of innovation time thrown back into the pool where people, that's the new starting point. And it's not just that. If that new starting point, every one of these researchers who's coming up with something else starting from that foundation will then have even greater innovation in this and in other areas. So that's 2022. Last year, a new program called Alpha Missense. Uh, and that was that in our body, we have all kinds of, I'm sure many of you, if you've had your genome sequenced and there's some kind of problem, they'll say, well, you have a, a mutation of unknown clinical significance. It's different than the normal, and we don't know whether it's good or bad. So with alpha missense, essentially what they did uh, is sequence the genomes, not just of a large number of humans, but a large number of humans and other primates. And the idea was if we share uh, a, a gene or a sequence with other primates, that, me that means it's been around for a lot of history. Um, and so, and it's in these other species, so it's, it's been evolutionary maintained, so it's probably safe. There, and then this year, uh, maybe you saw this week, uh, there's a prediction for soccer strategy, um, that they have an, an algorithm 
um, suggesting what's the optimal coaching strategy in a soccer game. They had uh, alpha geometry, um, which was at the level of the highest level competitors, high school competitors in the math Olympiad in geometry. Uh, we're now in this new age of multimodal AI, where it's not AI isn't just learning from text, but text, audio, video, AIs are starting to sense just like us. There's a long way to go, but this is moving so rapidly. And all of this is just one company. And there are lots of other companies. As a matter of fact, there's an arms race in these technologies. So there's more research, more investment, more change. And then the question is, well, what are the applications? Because again, this is not about technology in and of itself. It's about technology solving problems. In my new book, Super Convergence, I talk about this in the context of healthcare, of plant and animal agriculture, uh, industry, energy, data storage. But because it's Milan Longevity Week, I'd like to focus on just the applications in, in healthcare. So if you look at this image, this is an image of a healer. And although there's one little piece of technology, the stethoscope, when I had my, uh, I was uh, tested by the Dalai Lama's doctor, he was able to kind of figure out a lot of things just without a stethoscope, by listening, by feeling my, my pulse and other things. But this is a relationship between human beings, and that's what we want. When people go to see their healthcare provider, they are going to see a human being because we humans are great at doing human things. We have to figure out what that, what that is. Um, and this, what we are also seeing here is standard healthcare, which we practice around the world, which is what I call generalized healthcare. So generalized healthcare, it's the best thing that we've come up with since we've had healthcare, is humans being hu humans and being treated in standardized way, ways based on those identities. That's why if you walk into a high quality hospital anywhere in the world with a well-trained physician, you're going to be treated roughly the same way. It's why that if you have a headache and you go to the, the pharmacy and get a paracetamol, um, it's probably going to work for you because you're a human and these treatments have been proven to work pretty well for humans. But they don't work well for everybody because uh, some of us could have, uh, certainly in the United States, we have lots of people dying every year from acetaminophen, what we call Tylenol, because there are some people who have a terrible reaction. And the way that we find out if that happens is by having that reaction. The way that we found out if my father's first treatment for chemotherapy worked was by giving him that chemotherapy and then doing a scan later to see if it worked. But the whole idea behind personalized or precision medicine, precision healthcare, is that it doesn't have to be that way. The more that we know about who everybody is on an individual level, the more that we know about you as being uniquely you, the more that we're going to be able to treat you that way. And so how do we know who you are? How do we know that you are you? Certainly we need a lot of information. We need a lot of information from your health records. We need all the traditional things that we have. But we also need this new information, this new systems biological information. Obviously, sequence genomes, um, but we humans aren't just walking genomes. We are a system, a dynamic system of systems. And many of those systems, the proteome, the metabolome, the microbiome, are all areas where we're learning how to measure and how to assess. We're using the tools just like the ones I described with the AI and, and AlphaFold and, uh, and AlphaZero to understand the interaction of these systems uh, in, uh, at a population level. And that is moving us towards this world of precision healthcare. But the more data we collect, the, more, uh, the stronger our algorithms, the more computing power that we have, the more that we're going to be able to take the second shift. First was generalized to precision. The next step is from precision to predictive and preventive. Because if we know that we all live within a range of biological possibility, then the goal of our healthcare systems will be to optimize our lived experience within that range. And if we can, 
if we can, to say, well, what can we do to extend beyond that range in one area or another? And when we have that information, it's going to force us to think, well, the best way to treat something isn't to wait until the symptom emerge, emerges. If you have early stage Alzheimer's, uh, for example, and let's say it shows up in your 50s or your 60s, that's something that in many cases could conceivably have been identified at the moment of your conception. So there are lots of genetic disorders and other biological disorders that don't show up until later in life. But if we knew, if we knew that our newborn child had a greater than average chance of developing a genetic form of breast cancer, wouldn't we want to start screenings early, earlier? If we knew that our newborn child had an increased odds of developing type 2 diabetes, wouldn't we want to make sure that we instilled just lifestyle habits earlier in life to, to, uh, to prevent that? So we're really, it's a really exciting um, transition. And this transition is making some pretty amazing things possible. This is a woman named Victoria Gray. Uh, and Victoria Gray um, was one of the first people treated using gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And as she described it, her life was a living hell with sickle cell disease because so much pain and constant blood transfusions. This is her speaking last year in London at the Third International Summit on human genome editing. And five years before, at this same summit, which was held in Hong Kong in 2018, the announcement was made of the world's first CRISPR babies, which was a unbelievable violation of basic ethics by Ho Jiankui and his colleagues in, uh, in, in China. It was horrendous human experimentation. And that was the story in 2018. I was a member of the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Human Genome Editing. And we were created by Dr. Tedros in the aftermath of that to say, hey, this is something, it could be good, that certainly we need to think about the future of assisted reproduction. But if we don't do it wisely, if we don't do it well, if we're not dr uh, driven uh, by our values and guided by our values, this could become a terrible disaster. So this was last year's summit, and it was this incredible positive story that in a very responsible way, in a measured way, in a cautious way, in a careful way, she had been treated so that essentially the, the gene therapy turned on her body's ability to develop fetal hemoglobin, the kind of uh, hemoglobin that your body uh, develops when you're, when you're a fetus and, and very young. And that new hemoglobin essentially displaced her bad adult hemoglobin. And so far, uh, so far she's cured. Uh, at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, regulators in the United States uh, and then in, uh, in the UK um, approved this treatment for, uh, for sickle cell. There are many, many more uh, approvals that are either happening and thousands which are in the pipeline. That doesn't mean that they're all going to work, but thousands are in the, the pipeline. The costs are very high now, but we need to think about those costs relative to the costs of, uh, of lifetime treatment. And like all of these technologies, the costs will come down. But it's not about gene, uh, just gene therapies. Pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics are about what I was mentioning before, that if you're going to be treated, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be treated based on the type of disease that you have. You should be treated by the problem you're trying to address and who you are. If we can factor in the who you are, we're going to realize that there are a lot of things that we're doing that we shouldn't do, and a lot of things that we, that we could do that we may want to do using a cost-benefit analysis. So this is really, really exciting. In many ways, it's the future of, uh, of healthcare. And it's not just all of these great, exciting applications which are the future of healthcare. It's also about using these tools to do basic administrative tasks so that people in the healthcare system can focus on patients, even things like taking notes uh, during a, a uh, physician visit, AI can help. Uh, given the complexity both of human biology uh, and just of all of, of healthcare, it's going to be very, very difficult for human physicians, and I think actually dangerous, for human physicians to practice medicine alone, unaided. And it will also be dangerous for the foreseeable future 
for AI systems to practice medicine alone, AI uh, unaided. So the future isn't humans alone. It's not our machines alone. It's humans and our machines working collaboratively. And the future of healthcare and of everything else is going to be based on negotiating what that looks like. What do the machines do better than us? And let them do those things. What do we do better than them? Let us do those things. And what are the areas which are somewhere in between? And we need to figure out um, what is the role of humans and how do we interact with our machines? And this has big implications for longevity. So I don't need to tell you, you're here, it's Milan uh, Longevity Week. Longevity is something that we humans have been fighting for, for literally, technically, all of recorded history because our first work of literature is Gilgamesh written around 4,500 uh, 4, years ago. And I hope you've all read, uh, read Gilgamesh. Um, but it's a pretty incredible story. His best friend dies. And then he's inconsolable, and he goes on this long journey to find a guy who survived the Great Flood. It turned out they had one, too. And the guy gives him this magical plant of youth. And rather, this is good advice for you, he has this magical, rejuvenating plant. And all he has to do is eat the plant, and he's in great shape. But he decides, you know, this isn't a good idea. And for all of you DIY biohackers in the room, Listen to Gilgamesh. She said, no, it's not a good idea to actually take this plan. I'm going to take it back home to Uruk, which is in Sumeria. I'm going to take it back, and I'm going to find some old guy, and I'm going to give him some of this plant, and I'm going to see what happens to him. And if that works, then I'll take it myself. It's what Nir Barzilai is recommending for the TAME trial. Don't, do it on your, don't experiment on yourself. But what happens is he's on his way home, and then, as happens in, in epic Sumerian um, narratives, he decides to go for a swim. And so he puts the plant on a rock, and he jumps in. And then this snake comes and eats the plant. And then he can't find the plant. And then he goes home, and he realizes, well, I'm just going to you know, live a good life and be immortal in, in other ways. Um, but 4,500 years ago, first piece of recorded literature, that's what they're talking about, uh, Amrita. Uh, in Hindu mythology, uh, the gods are fighting over Amrita, which is the nectar of life and immortality. And even more close to home, and literally close to home, uh, here in Italy, the guy in this cartoon image is Serge Voronoff. So at the turn of the 20th century, in the early 1900s, uh, he, having uh, gone to Egypt, and he saw that there were these eunuchs who were kind of lethargic and bloated, he thought, well, if the eunuchs are lethargic, it must be that the removal of testicles is causing them to age. Therefore, we should add testicles. And so the idea was to castrate monkeys, um, to grind up their testicles, and give people injections of ground testicles. For 20 years, this was considered the forefront of longevity science. He made so much money that he bought, it's still there, you can visit, he bought a huge castle in Grimaldi. You can go visit, it's, ca it's called Castle, castle Voronov. It turned out it didn't work. So don't try this, don't try this at home. But 4,500 years ago, and for sure much, much longer than that, we humans have been trying to beat the deal that biology has given us. And the good news is that we have done it. We have done it. Over the last 100 years in the United States, average life expectancy has gone from around 40 years to around, around 80 years. And it's happened because of health, because of public health, nutrition, worker safety, all these kinds of things that now we take for granted were really revolutionary. So we know how to extend average health spans. And we know what interventions absolutely work, to ex certainly to extend health span, and probably to extend lifespan. Maybe if you, you guys know them about some of these blue zone uh, ideas. But exercise, um, the studies show that if you exercise about 45 minutes a day, you can add around four and a half years of, of health span, eating healthy, community, 
this, this, these two poor monkeys are trotted out over and over. These are the, the caloric restrictions uh, monkey. The kind of sad and miserable uh, one is the one who just kind of ate whatever he wanted whenever he wanted. And the, that good-looking one is the one who had uh, calorie restrictions. So we know that caloric restrictions works in lab animals. We don't know whether it works in, in humans, although we have some people who are testing it out for us. Um, but you could have these same two monkeys, and you could try anything in this slide. Like you could have an exercise monkey and a sit on your rear end monkey, and you would have these two things. You could have eat a healthy diet monkey and eat crap monkey, and they would look this way. You'd have live in a, in a um, well, in nurturing community monkey and a solitary confinement monkey, and they would all look different. So we know what interventions work. And we have ideas about what else might work. And so when we think about hacking the process of aging, the first question that we need to ask is, well, what is aging? Chronological aging is easy uh, to define. Just look at your, at your driver's license. But biological aging, if we're trying to change how people age biologically, we need to think about, well, how do we measure it? How do we measure it in a uniform way that applies to everybody equally? And that's much harder to do because we don't even know whether there's a master switch for aging, whether aging is one thing. And, and the thing from the last slide, like exercising your whole li life because that affects most of the systems of aging, that's some indication that maybe there is some kind of master switch or series of master switches for aging. But it could be like your car, uh, that there's a bunch of different independent systems because you could have a car that could age really, really well except for the spark plug except for the carburetor, and then the car still doesn't work. So we really think about aging, we need to measure it, and then we need to think, well, how can we extend it in a way that is somewhat uniform? And the other question that we have is, well, where can we get clues about how we might do it? And, kind of, and two ways that we can do it. I don't know if, if Vera is here, but this is one of Vera's naked mole rats. One is to look at animal models and comparative biology. So the naked mole rats, uh, which live um, underground in the Horn of Africa, uh, they can live uh, more than 30 years compared to a mouse that in captivity can live around three years. And so what is it about these naked mole rats? That's why there are lots of captive colonies of naked mole rats at, at Calico and, and Vera has one to say, well, what is it? How can they fight? cancer uh, so well? Um, how, how do we learn from animals like these or comparing the Icelandic, Icelandic um, clams to the hard clams? The Icelandic ones can live over 500 years and the hard clams, which are what we're more used to in, in, in the Atlantic, in our side of the Atlantic, can live 40 or 50 years. Why? Or the immortal jellyfish that seem to last forever, getting older and then turning into polyps and then re-emerging. So there's a lot of clues that we can get from animal models. And from human models, this person is named Fauja Singh, who's known as the turbaned uh, tornado. He's a marathon runner in Canada. 100 years old, ran a marathon. And I hope everyone, I'm gonna be running the half marathon on Sunday, so in Milan, so I hope everybody else is gonna be either running or, or, or cheering. So one of the things that we can do uh, is study these individuals as Near Barzillai and others are doing. Say so we're going to find these people and we're going to look at what they're uh, at what they're doing. And there's a lot of work that's going into that. And the second thing, uh, the blue zone model, is we're going to look at populations that are living longer than average. So the individual model says, what is it about each person's individual biology? Are there specific genes that are longevity genes? And the communal study says, well, what is it about lifestyle? And both are important because when we think about hacking aging, we don't want to do it just on one level. We don't want to do it just on the individual level, although we really need to understand it. And the reason to understand it is because most of the diseases which we're afraid of, cancer, heart disease, uh, dementia, are correlated with aging. And so rather than spending all of our money on treating those diseases, if we can slow the biological rate of aging, we can at very least push off the time 
uh, for the onset of these kinds of, of diseases so we can unlock, unleash a lot of human potential and reallocate a lot of resources in our healthcare systems. But the group thing is also really important, and that's why there's an ethical issue uh, for us is that if, if we could get, if our goal is extending average human lifespan, we know how to do it. We do all the things that we've learned how to do over the last hundred years, just make sure that the most vulnerable and underserved populations around the world have access to those things. But in terms of hacking the biology, we're now entering this golden age for the basic science of hacking biology. And so there are lots of incredible possibilities. Remember the word possibilities of things that we might do. Near here is the world's expert uh, in metformin, of thinking, well, is there a way that metformin can do in humans what it seems to do in animals, which is extend healthy human lifespan. NAD plus, I think David Sinclair is coming, who's been a big uh, proponent of the information theory of aging and NAD, NAD plus boosters, um, NR and NMN, basically the goal is to improve the human's ability. It's like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy uh, to not generate so many errors over time. Uh, rapamycin, uh, Joan Manick is, going to, is here uh, talking about all these different interventions. There are other things that are being explored, para, uh, asynchronous parabiosis, uh, essentially sewing an old and a young mouse together and th because of the way that the blood serum interacts, the old mouse becomes younger and the young mouse becomes older and that suggests that there's something is happening that could conceivably uh, be replicated. There's new fields of senolytics, uh, autophagous agents. There's all kinds of really incredible basic science and we have to invest in this basic science because there's so much potential there, and that's where we are. But we also need to recognize that none of these interventions are proven systemically for humans. And so while we have to invest in the basic science, we need to do it in a way that is responsible. Because for all we know, there was a time when people said, well, tel uh, the, because you, your telomeres get shorter as you age, you should just take telomerase and that will extend your telomeres and you'll be great. And so people started to do that, biohackers started to do that, and it turned out it was carcinogenic because our bodies are evolved ecosystems that have evolved over billions of years. And if it were just so easy to do simple interventions to change it with no cost, that would be great. But it's very often not the case. So basic science is incredibly important. Uh, and then there are even more aggressive interventions that we can and should think about. My, my last book, Hacking Darwin, was on the future of assisted human reproduction. As we understand more of the genetics of superagers, uh, and as more of us have children through in vitro fertilization and embryo screening, pre-implantation genetic testing, it's very likely that it's going to be possible that potential parents choosing among 10 possible embryos one of the things they may be able to choose for is that of your 10 natural embryos, this one or these two have the greatest chance of living a long and healthy life. And it could well be possible that we would do specific genome editing on, genome editing on pre implanted embryos, for example, to change an APOE4 gene into a 2 that could conceivably. Uh, give that future child some greater chance of living a long and healthy life. As I mentioned, people trying to do this, um, Hu Jiankui in China, were wildly unethical. We can't do that now. We shouldn't do it now. But what we're talking about is dreaming, imagining a future, and thinking differently about assisted reproduction may be part of that future. But again, we need to be clear about this line between basic science and applied science. So basic science is what are the problems that we're trying to solve? How are we trying to understand these complex systems? And we should be investing massively in the basic science of aging because, as I mentioned before, it's connected to so many other things. 
but we should have pretty high criteria for jumping from basic science into applied science. Like I said with the assisted uh, reproduction and the CRISPR babies, it's the same for all of these different areas. We need to have systematic tests to try to figure out uh, what works. And there's a balance here because I'm really excited about the basic science. I think the excitement about the basic science is inspiring people to invest in this field and we need that investment. We need governments and regulators to take this seriously so we can move forward as quickly as possible. But we need to be mindful of the line between basic and applied science. And as I said before, the key issue will be ethics and values. And COVID-19 in many ways was a microcosm of all of these issues. COVID-19 um, was a problem created by globalization and yet the globalization of science and technology were such an essential part of our response to it. The mRNA vaccines were unbelievably significant in, from a historical perspective, that we basically developed a new way of delivering alternate instructions to ourselves. So it wasn't just about the vaccines, but a new framework for delivering healthcare that we went from a sequenced genome, which is something that quite recently we wouldn't have had, but from a sequenced genome to a fully functional vaccine at scale in 11 months is a miracle. Some of you may know that I've been at the center of the debate on COVID-19 origins uh, from the very beginning. And it's my view uh, that the pandemic most likely stems from a research, an accidental research related incident in Wuhan. I was the lead witness in the US congressional hearings on COVID-19 origins last year. And the reason why I'm so passionate about these issues is that we need to be mindful that all of these exciting things that we're talking about have another side of the coin. As ex the things that we're most excited about, the genome editing, the gene therapies, CRISPR, all of these things can equally be used for nefarious or even accidentally nefarious purposes. And I think we forgot that. And certainly China, in my view, forgot that in the context of COVID-19. So what do we do? What do we do? If I said in the beginning that our mission in all of this is to integrate our values into the frameworks, into the decisions that we're going to, be, we're going to make about how these technologies are applied, how do we do that? In my new book, I've got a whole framework in the final chapter but it's got to start with people. It's got to start with individuals. We are not, I wish I could say we live in a world, our governments are so sophisticated that they're just going to handle it. Or the United Nations is functioning so well that we don't need to do anything and just go on with your lives. We do not live in that world. It's up to all of us. And so the first step, which is why I'm so glad that you're all here and it's, all here and it's why I'm here, is education. We need to educate ourselves. That's why this mission and this mission are so critically important. And with that education, we need to engage the people around us in our communities, our elected officials. We need to say, hey, these are really important issues to us. And we want our representatives, our communities, to be engaging thoughtfully on these issues. We also have a global collective action problem. Our species very rapidly has gone from small bands of roving nomads into this globalized world where even small number of us have the ability to affect massive changes on a global level. And one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face is the mismatch between the nature of these problems, which are our biggest problems are global and common, and the absence of a sufficient framework for addressing that entire category of, uh, of challenges. And that's certainly why I and others founded the Global Interdependence Movement, One Shared World, One Shared uh, Dot World. Uh, but we're going to have to have a jump up in the way that we're organized, like we did in Europe in 1648 after the Thirty Years' War, uh, like we did starting in San Francisco in 1945 after World War II. We need to recognize in our age of revolutionary technology that we live in an interconnected and inter interdependent world. And if we can't generate a politics recognizing that reality, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. This, as you all know, is a Seurat painting. And if you look too closely, you just see a bunch of dots. 
and we are all a bunch of dots. And the question is, can we organize ourselves into a beautiful painting? A painting that tells a story of who we are as a species and where we would like to go. And this is a, a version of an Italian image. Our one species suddenly has superpowers that for millennia we have attributed to our gods. And the question for us is whether or not we can learn to use these powers wisely. Thank you.